um, this, um, this book really came out of the experience we were having as we worked on horizontal inequalities, um, that over and over again, extractives just seem to be at the heart of this interface between inequality and, and violence. And we just wanted to understand better why, what was really going on, why so strong a coincidence. Um, so that's, that's where this book has come into the Queen's program, um, written by five of us, um, all named up there. And um, I really want to, to emphasize um, one of the things I particularly enjoyed about doing this book was the team, the team experience. We really worked to, um, to make the book written by, th the whole book written by five people. We did individual case studies, but we worked on them together, <coughs> and the, fi uh, the three thematic chapters were really developed together. And that's actually been a characteristic of, I think, really of the, the Queen's books in general, and very much Francis's leadership, and a, a real um, encouragement, I think, to the concept of research center. It can be very, very rewarding, I think. Okay, um, so, yes. Um, we had a, a rather straightforward framework, a sort of demand and supply framework around the necessary institutions if you're going to um, deal with this potential conflict between extractive, uh, this interaction between extractives, HIs, and, and conflict. Um, except it's not really, uh, of course, um, demand, because the demand for the right institutions, unfortunately, is not usually um, a politically articulated demand, but a real need, all right? So perhaps need is the better <coughs> word, not demand. And the need, I think this is very, very well known, but the, um, the need is this <coughs> extraordinarily <coughs> difficult political economy of extractives, particularly when the extractives are point source, a mine, a well, whatever it is. Um, and um, I mentioned there the, thank you, I mentioned there perhaps four of the main um, aspects of this extraordinarily diffi <coughs> difficult political economy. Location, where the mine is, just comes into the discussion over and over again. Scale, large scale, um, technology, sophisticated technology, and environmental issues. All of these lead to endless tensions, and it's tensions between the, the multinational firm and the local communities, tension between um, the local level, the communities and the municipalities, and the regional level, regional governments, and the national government. Tremendous tensions um, around distribution, um, and with those tensions, always the potential for, for violence, particularly at the, at the local level. Um, so conflict and distributional tensions really built in. On the supply side, um, this is um, perhaps less obvious to us out of, um, or we know about extractives, but um, our idea was, and what we really pursued in the book, is that actually the possession of a, a major extractive space tends, unfortunately, to undermine or distort the very institutions you most need to sort out all these conflicts, um, all these tensions, distributional conflictual tensions. Um, and uh, there are many, many, many th aspects to that tension, but um, I would emphasize perhaps particularly um, the bias against, over time, the bias against developing the institutions you need if you're going to diversify, use the resources of extractives to diversify the rest of the economy, to diversify opportunities for those um, not included in the mining operation, and a bias towards repression rather than developing the instruments of mediation, because always in the short term it seems just the right thing to do to create um, um, what looks like a peaceful playing field to bring in the multinational, that issue just wins out over and over again with all the time long run consequences. And so our, th our focus in the book, um, perhaps our principal focus because it's less worked on, was this long run understanding of the supply side of the institutions you need if you're going to mediate all these, these tensions and problems. Um, we took four cases, of, um, um, six cases, four that in the common parlance are usually considered a failure, Bolivia, Niger, Nigeria, and Peru. Um, and then two cases usually considered a success, and that's Botswana and Chile. And I do emphasize that it's only <coughs> relative success. I mean, if any of you here are going to challenge me on, come on, Botswana is not a success, of course we agree with you, and we, we're much more subtle than that, but there's not time to tell you about all our subtleties. Okay, so what did we, the principal findings in terms of differences, I think what we emphasize very much is the importance of location, 
um, Chile's mines are up in the desert area with very few um, communities run, very little local population. That was immensely helpful in, in managing conflict, avoiding conflict. Importance of timing and sequencing. When does your boom come in relation to the international economy and in relation to your own internal development of institutions? Quite crucial. Importance of leadership, but leadership not the so much the individual alone, charismatic individual or not so charismatic but powerful individual, but the social and political context and the economic context within which the individual is, is working. That's what matters. Um, okay, um, I'm going to move straight on to the second book. Um, this is um, deep within the Cree's theme, th this book, um, and it's the only case study, the only country case study we're presenting here, um, Peru. Um, we were were keen to push deep into one country to really understand and flesh out the nature of horizontal inequalities, the significance of horizontal inequalities, and their persistence over time. So I was very glad that Chris mentioned the themes of exploitation and collective action, because I think you see both those themes very much coming out in what we did. Um, the so the book um, divides into two halves. And the first half is really the, the understanding and the documenting of the reality of horizontal in, I inequalities. Um, and it's part quantitative and part qualitative. Um, and I think, again, one of the things I really enjoyed in this book was bringing together very strongly the quantitative side and the qualitative side without any sort of putting down of the qualitative side at all. The quantitative, we had uh, excellent um, collaborators, Adolfo Figueroa, ba Manuel Baron, and, and David Sulmont working with us on the measurement of horizontal inequalities as far as we could over time. Um, the qualitative side, we worked in interviewing and focus groups and what have you to build up and reflect on a very um, qualitative understanding. Um, you've all been so good and so patient, you need an eye relaxant. Here's my, here's my co-author. Doing field work. <laughs> That's doing field work, right? Okay. Uh, they've all been a bit squashed in this projection. They're not <laughs> 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 Sorry, their beauty is being affected by this. Um, here she is working. Look, there you are, notebook and all. Um, so we, we did a, um, a, a lot of interviewing in folk uh, uh, and a lot of interviewing to really deepen our own understanding, both of the, the interactions that go on over time and the interactions between different kinds of inequalities, between the political, social, cultural, ethnic, um, economic, to, to, to embed, to really make quite vicious the vicious circles that occur. I'll give you just one example. Um, I think an example that came out very strikingly from our interviews um, has to do with um, education. Um, very typical situation in the high mountains, the Sierra of Peru, is that um, the there is, um, if you're lucky, there is a, a local primary school, certainly two years of primary school within reasonable reach of you, and kids will go to primary school. And sometimes, at least, in that primary school, they will be largely with other indigenous children, and they may even have indigenous teachers, and the, they will be the bouncy kind of young children that we all know and love. Secondary education is much more of a problem because it isn't available locally. So a very typical pattern is that a child is sent away at the, the age of when, re when ready for secondary education, sent away to some town where they basically live in some kind of boarding house situation. They live with a woman who takes in such children for this purpose, and they go to school in a town, and they meet for the first time <coughs> discrimination, prejudice, unfamiliar, hostile environment, and they have no family support. They're there on their own. It's a very lonely time, very embittering time very often, and a time which produces, in these lovely, bouncy, self-confident kids, the alienated, unconfident, lacking self-esteem teenager that you know we you meet, unfortunately, um, out of this process. So that was a really sad bit of understanding something about persistence of inequality. Um, OK, um, now the second part of the book is about why. Why so persistent, these inequalities? Why so, so persistent and so severe? Um, and this is where all these interactions um, work out. The interactions of geography in Peru is very extreme with the high Andes and the coastal area where, where white people historically lived anyway. It's all changed today. The economic pathway, ethnic discrimination and politics all interact over centuries to produce an embedded situation um, of lack of self-esteem on one side. It's the internalization of this, the, these inequalities, which is so depressing to, to hear about. 
Um, and of course it begins with the colony, the <laughs> inevitably. It's with the, the colony by um, Spain finds it all too efficient and convenient to have a very submissive labor force and discrimination and prejudice. The fact that these people are not really considered fully human through some stages of the colony is very useful to the economic model. That's all a cementing already. And it's with the colony. Before the colony, P Peru is certainly no utopia, eh, but what comes civiliz earlier civilizations are not equal, far from it. But with the colony, you get this incredible overlap between class and ethnicity, which remains a real deep overlapping over, over decades and decades in Peru and is still observable today. And that is very, very deep in the explaining of the persistence of inequality. Um, then with, in, uh, with independence, the story is one of increased centralizing of, the, of what counts, I use the word to, um, in, in, in inverted commas, um, on the coast. The capital is not up in the Sierra, which it might well have been, there were possibilities, it's down on the coast, it's Lima. The, uh, the activities, the first major activity of independence is Guano, not on the coast, but off the coast in the sea. Um, a centering on the coast, and this becomes cum cumulative over time, um, with huge consequences for where public investment goes and private investment. Elites concentrate themselves, even the, the, the regional elites of the Sierra move to Lima, live in Lima, have their business interests there. This can be documented, we've shown it. Um, has consequences, therefore, in infrastructure, consequences in attitudes and customs, and all kinds, all levels of, of institutions, certainly the structures of local government and regional government. And then, um, moving very rapidly on because of this lack of time, um, in, in the 20th century, what you see is that, of course, sometimes there are progressive policies, um, but these progressive policies don't allow for the underlying legacy of institutions which are shaping power and prejudice and so forth. And um, a couple of examples I mentioned to you that we develop in the book a lot, education and land reform. Um, education is, for, for me, was the r one of the most um, deep and poignant experiences of writing this book was to understand how far education could be part of the problem, not part of the solution. Um, and um, the, result, the result of these, these um, Progressive policies that fail, have perverse outcomes, is again dynamics that further embed horizontal inequalities based on interactions all the time between the different elements of inequality. And again, I keep emphasizing um, the dynamics. And an example of this, my, and this is my final slide, an example would be, if we take land reform, inappropriate land reform done by a quite radical government in the early 1970s, but based on a very false understanding of the social, political, cultural st structures. That creates more marginal people. The collectives <laughs> they introduce exclude people. The, um, the exclusion creates an aggravation of horizontal inequalities. It creates discon discontent. In due course, there is an increased supply of recruits to the, um, to the terrorist organization, to Sendero, increased violence, displacing of the indigenous populations to the towns where they're seen as suspect terrorists, they can't get jobs, they experience discrimination, with that more political alienation, et cetera. So it goes on. That would be <laughs> one among many of these um, kinds of vicious circle stories. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Rosemary.